There will be no live demonstration. Hee hee. So I can relax. Um, apparently there's no interweb thing here. There's a hacker in town or something that's broken. So, um, so I can't give you a live demo, but uh, hopefully that won't matter. Okay, so uh, who am I? My name's Major Malfunction. Um, as a, a few of you will know, I'm a goon here. I've been here for a few years. I do a lot of open source research and development, publish, try and publish pretty much everything I do, stuff that won't get me whacked, you know, um, and stuff that will, but uh, we'll talk about some of that later. Currently obsessed with uh, RFID. I've done a lot of stuff on Bluetooth. Uh, I really do strongly believe in full disclosure. Um, I do describe myself as a hacker. I mean, it's a great line at parties and things. What do you do? I'm a hacker. So, really? Isn't that illegal? Um, but yeah, I'm a white hat hacker. Um, always have been, so I don't know how many gray hats there are in here, but uh, those times are over when we were being, or they were being, oops, when they were being recruited. Um, and uh, yeah, freelance research training, uh, I'm completely independent, so if you want to help me put my kids through college, come and see me afterwards. Okay, um, why am I talking about satellites now? I saw a, a talk a couple of years ago at uh, Hack in the Box by um, Jim Giavidi, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce that other name, um, called Hacking a Bird in the Sky. Did anyone see that? No? Okay, look it up on, on uh, Google Video or YouTube Video. Um, basically, these guys hacked a VSAT and were like getting IP over the satellite. And they put together a really cool video with kind of background music and stuff. It was really good. And uh, one of the things he said during the talk was, you know, this is really old technology and, and, you know, it's been around for a long time. People must have been doing stuff in this field. Uh, so, you know, he encouraged anyone who's been doing work on satellite stuff to, to come out and, and talk about it. So, um, you know, I like old school stuff and I talk about old school stuff fairly often. And satellite's pretty damn old school. So uh, I started playing with satellite stuff in the 90s. So I thought, okay, you know, that was a call to arms. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll present my stuff. And why did it take so long? You know, it's 10 years I've been doing this, so why has it taken me so long to talk about it? Trouble with satellite, you know, you start off with really good intentions and you're going to spend the whole night looking for interesting data feeds or something, and you start scanning, and then suddenly there's boobies. <laughs> and he's just like, fuck, that's my night gone now. So, 10 years to get a month's worth of work done. I think, yeah. <laughs> so that's basically it, that's why. Yeah. Anyway, in, in the last three days before the conference, I crammed it all together. And I'm going to present what I found. So what I'm really talking about... Um, Feeding my sat monkey is looking for feeds, okay? So feed hunting, anyone here understand what I mean by feed hunting? Okay, quite a few of you have, have done it. Basically, feed hunting is looking for interesting stuff that's coming down from satellites. So I'm not talking about breaking into the satellites and maybe, you know, knocking them off trajectory and knocking out a, a Chinese one or a Russian one or a Georgian one, depending who I'm working for. So, um, what I'm looking at is what's coming down off the satellite. And basically, you know, traditional feed hunting was looking for free content. So again, it's not about hacking the encrypted channels. Um, what we're looking for is opportunistic capture of interesting stuff, whether it's video or data or whatever. And the way feed hunting works is like tuning a TV in a hotel room where you're looking for all the interesting channels. Um, Basically, you're doing the same thing, but for satellites. So you've not only got all the channels on, on one feed, you've got multiple satellites. You've got to scan all those satellites and all the frequencies and look for something interesting. Uh, and it takes a long time, and it's really tedious, and you find a lot of uninteresting crap, and it's really difficult to keep track of. And so what people do is they start posting it onto forums and mailing lists and websites and so on. And they get out of date, and they get, you know, it's difficult to know who's got interesting content. You get into that whole web link thing where you find something that looks interesting, but it takes you to another site that tells you about another site that tells you about another site. 
and so on. So um, I found it quite, you know, not very useful. And really, it's poking in the dark. Okay. So you find these sites, and here's a list of, of various feeds that you might, or feed sites, where these people are all dedicated to this um, hobby of, of feed hunting. So from here, you can link on to some other places. So here's one where they actually show you where the satellites are positioned in the sky and what their footprints are and stuff like that. So if you're interested in a particular bird, you can go and look and see what the coverage might be. And then you get stuff like this where um, you've actually got someone now posting information about a particular feed they found or a particular transponder they found. And so there's some details in here. You've got the name of the the channel, you've got which transponder frequency and it's on and so on. So if you think that's interesting, you can go and tune in. But typically, you know, this stuff goes out of date really quickly. So you'll, you will have spent all day, instead of looking at tuning, you know, snow on your screen and tuning your channels, you would have been looking at websites all day and, and finding stuff to look at. And you get there and there's nothing there. So that can be pretty dull. And occasionally you find some picture or some image or, you know, something interesting. So I thought there must be a better way of doing this. Okay. There must be some way of sorting this data and, and extracting the goodness out of uh, all of this crap. And again, those of you who have seen my talks previously, you know I quite often bang on about visualization. So I, I really like to visualize my problems and try and use the, the visual processing power of the human brain to, to extract useful information. We do it really quickly without even thinking about it. So, you know, you recognize food and danger and friends and enemies and boobies and, you know. Uh, and it just happens without you having to, to think about it. So I thought, okay, how can I tap into that and, and get some useful information out of the, all of this data? So um, this is actually something we did, my brother and I did, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and we came up with this representation uh, scheme. So this is uh, a scan of the sky. I don't know how well it, it shows. Can you see that well at the back there? Is the contrast OK? See some red blobs on the black? OK, so basically what this is is a, a map of the sky. And what we have along the bottom is is the, um, the angle that I'm pointing my dish at. Actually, these are just stop numbers on the, the steerable dish. So basically, we're pointing here. I'm pointing to the east as far as my dish will steer to the east. And over here, I'm pointing to the west. And then this axis is frequency. So I'm scanning from 10.7 gigahertz up to 13 gigahertz. Okay. And basically, what I do is I just step the motor scan all the frequencies, draw a dot, and the dot represents the signal that I've just seen. If there's no data at all, it's a black dot. If there's some data, but there's no um, discernible image coming off it, so I can't discern what, what it is, if it's PAL or um, NTSC or whatever, then it's a white dot. And if I get a good signal that I can lock onto, then it's a red dot. So you just do that. You scan the frequencies, step, scan, step, scan, step, scan. And eventually, you've built up this nice picture of the sky. And to me, when I looked at that, it was like, fantastic. I instantly get a huge amount of information from that. It just jumps out of the screen at you exactly what I'm trying to do, which is find interesting stuff. So for example, sorry, just, uh, where are you going? This big blob here, what you've got here is a lot of frequencies that are active on a single satellite. So it's, it's stationary. We've got a whole load of frequencies that are big and blobby and easy to tune into. So that's a consumer satellite with a whole bunch of channels on it. Okay, and this is actually Astra. So in the UK, our main satellite um, feed is Astra. And then we've got another commercial one here, and that's probably Hotbird. And then over here, we've got some others with less channels on, but still quite densely populated. But over here, we've got a really tight little signal, all on its own, 
Um, I've got to zoom in for those that can't see it. So I'm talking about that dot. So if you've got a really tight little signal on a satellite all on its own and there's no other frequencies, that might be interesting, don't you think? Yeah? So immediately I hit pay dirt. Okay, I can get really useful stuff out of this. So the other thing I found I could do was um, time travel. I've always wanted to time travel. I don't know about you, probably a lot of you have too. But uh, yeah, time travel is really useful. So with time traveling, what we're doing is we're doing the scan, and then we do it again, and then we compare the two. So again, I hope you can see this. Uh, maybe not. If you look really closely at this little group here, so as I flick between day one and day two, you see a couple of blobs appearing. Can you see that? No? Damn it. Okay, imagine, I, imagine this is the thing. Blob. No blob. Oh, going wrong way. Blob. See, I can't even coordinate. I've been up all night. Let's try again. Blob. No blob. Blob. Ah. Okay. Someone else come up and do this talk for me. Okay, so basically what, you, what I'm seeing up here, and it's really cool, by the way, is um, two little blobs appear that weren't there yesterday. So what that means is those two frequencies have become active when they weren't active yesterday. So again, probably really interesting because that's something new. Um, if it's a new commercial channel, then yeah, big deal. But if it's on a, uh, on a, um, a rental satellite, for example, where you actually buy time on the satellite, they only switch the transponders on when they've got something to send. Because this, you know, it costs money to start send stuff over there. So it's not doing anything unless it's doing something. So if they suddenly get switched on, then that's probably really interesting. And in fact, the, um, the best example of, of some stuff we found that way was back when uh, Princess Diana was killed. Um, what happened is a load of journalists from the UK flew over to Paris to cover the story. And then because they never knew quite what was going to happen or when the breaking news was going to come out, they had permanent live satellite feeds going from their hotel rooms, a couple of teams we found, going from their hotel rooms um, back to the UK. So they could sit in the hotel and they could get a phone call and then run out and um, you know, cover the, find out what was going on. And then they'd come back to the hotel, straighten their tie, stand in front of the camera, do their piece to camera. And then they'd sit down and news crews, you know, they forget about cameras. They've got them around them all day. So they would sit there and they'd be having a cigarette and drinking a coffee and slagging each other off and gossiping about you know, stuff going on in the office. But also, news was coming in the whole time. So we'd hear the phone calls, we'd hear one end of the conversation, you know, we'd hear all these little rumors, oh, a guy in a white car was seen doing this. So you know, we were hearing all this stuff way before it hit the news. Um, really interesting stuff. The other stuff you find um, is feeds coming across from, um, say, the big fight in Vegas. So, you know, there's a big fight here. It's going to be pay-per-view in the UK. What they do is they bounce it across from, from another satellite. Um, so they'll uplink it to something over here, which will then side-channel it to something here, which will then beam it back down to the, the, the base station in the UK, and then they'll edit it and send it over the pay-per-view feed. So again, if you can see that, that spot being lit up the day before the fight, then probably that's the feed for the fight. And if you tune into it, you'll get the fight for free. Um, so that's traditionally what feed hunters look for, that kind of stuff. You know. So this was 10 years ago. It was actually really difficult to do this stuff then, um, apart from the problems of your attention span once you start doing it. But the actual equipment to do it was um, basically pretty proprietary. You know, there were no open standards for how you do this stuff. It was mostly undocumented. The manufacturers didn't really want to help us figure it out. Uh, we had to build special hardware to convert their interfaces to something a PC could talk to um, and to, to understand the signals that were being sent back and so on. Um, so it was a real pain, basically. Now we have open standards. 
We've got DVB cards we can plug directly into a, a PC. You've got Linux receivers, uh, well, embedded receivers. So the actual boxes you buy, consumer electronics that do satellite, sometimes actually have Linux running under the hood, so you can just shell into the box and do stuff. Um, the box I actually use is called a Dream Box, and it's based on the Tuxbox distribution. Um, it's all open source, and there are cross compilers you can run on a PC to build the tools to, to run on these things. Okay. Mostly works over a web interface. You go to the web page, you select what program you want to go to, the dish will steer automatically. Um, and you can actually look at the properties of the feeds that you found, so you can get more detail directly from the web interface. So this is typically um, what the web interface looks like. So you go, you, you can go and tune into the channels that you want. And then you can bring up the actual information about the stream. So in this case, I'm looking at a stream that says it's something to do with Labrooks. Labrooks is a booking chain, a, a betting chain in the UK. So this is Labrooks Blackjack. Okay, so they're sending some kind of um, but gambling uh, data feed across here. And um, an interesting field here is supported cri crypto systems. So we've got Via Access, we've got IDTO, we've got uh, BetaCrypt, we've got um, DreamCrypt. Used crypto systems, none. That's handy. Same again, we got an open MUX IP gateway. Well, that sounds quite interesting. Supported crypto systems. Media Guard, Fire Access, IRDTO, Conax, BetaCrypt, DreamCrypt, used crypto systems, none. Okay, I think we see a pattern developing here. So there's this tool um, you can run on the command line called DVB Snoop. DVB Snoop has been described as like Wireshark for DVB. Basically, it gives you just raw access to the data that's coming in over the card, uh, and it will decode. The, the data is divided into things called PIDs, and the PIDs basically divide up so you can stream. It multiplexes video and data and audio and so on. So you can look for an actual PID that contains the data you're interested in and, and extract that. So this is what it looks like. It's a little bit blurry still. Um, basically, I'm just getting signal strength from this screen. And then you start to get stuff like uh, the actual list of PIDs. So here we've got um, the program map, association tables, conditional access tables, and so on. So if you wanted to attack the crypto on a crypto channel, you could extract the streams that you need that are sending the keys and so on. Here we start to see some actual data. So we've got service name, um, so a description of what this channel is. So again, you could write code that just goes through and extracts all the channel names and so on. You even get uh, EPG, so Electronic Program Guide, so you actually get a description of the programs that are coming through. And you can get a service name list, so these are all the channels that are running on a single transponder. So I can very quickly step through each of those transponders and get a list of the channels that they're delivering, or the, on that satellite, what all the different transponders are delivering, rather. So I can then marry those up with all the transponder frequencies I've seen. And if I don't get a description, then I know, again, I've got something interesting. So this is a non-commercial channel on this satellite that maybe I should go and have a look at. Yeah. And this is where the really interesting stuff comes in. So the, um, when you see something with DVB datagram, that's basically IP data. So if we extract just that PID, then we get useful data that we can tap into. So here we see MAC addresses going across. 
IP addresses. So there's a destination IP address and a source IP address. Some actual UDP data packets. So here's some update being sent to a box, presumably a firmware or a, a software update. So one of my goals when I started writing software that for this was to avoid actually writing any code. What I wanted to do was just use the existing interfaces and, and interface with those. In the end, it turned out that actually you can't do arbitrary steering of the dish. You have to actually have the, the dish configured so it knows about all the frequencies you want to talk to and, and all the satellites you want to go to. So in the end, I had to write a bunch of tools to change the config files on the fly to then allow the other tools to, to tell the, the web interface to do the steering. So I've ended up kind of doing a mixture. I've got stuff that runs on the, the box itself, and I've got stuff that runs externally and just talks to the web interface. Okay. And you can use, as, as I said, it, because it's a Linux box, you can SSH into it and run stuff on there and get the output back to your normal box. And you can run DVB snoop to, to see what's going on. You can also set up um, interfaces directly that take the DVB and feed it into an ether. Okay. So this is what it would normally look like. I've selected Astra, and I've got my channels here. This is what it looks like after I've reconfigured it. So basically, I send a bunch of data that reconfigures the box to just say, OK, I don't care what the satellite is. I just want orbit 260, orbit 261, and so on. So that's an actual position in the sky, 26 east in the UK. So I've written a bit of code called Dream Map, which I'll be releasing shortly. Um, as always, it's written in Python, because I'm a Python geek now. Yes, Python rules. Um, Java sucks. Actually, <laughs> you know that film, I'm going to start a holy war now. You know that film, Twins, where you take all the evil out of, out of a pair of twins, and that goes in one, and all the good goes in the other. It's like, okay, if you take C, and you take Java, and you take all the evil out, sorry, if you take, no, well, you, you get where I'm going with this. So. <laughs> I'm going to get lynched after this talk. I love Python. All other languages are okay. Actually, Java's not that bad. I'm starting to learn Java for one of the things that I can't talk about or I'll get whacked. Um, and I'll talk about it later in the ready room if uh, anyone wants to, but not here because I'll get whacked. Um, and it's not that bad. It is a bit like a cross between C and Python, I suppose, in a perverted kind of way. So what I do, I have a script that talks to the web interface. I grab the URLs and I pull stuff off them. Um, and I'm now creating a 3D model because I can. Okay. Because Python is like that. You can just say, oh, I think I want to do 3D. Import 3D, and it all goes bling. So this is what it looks like. Um, similar layout. You've got the frequency, and you've got the orbits. But now I've got these pretty blobs instead of a, a flat graphic. And the idea behind doing the 3D model was actually I can start to use shape as well as color um, to, to give me information. And I can fly around in it, and it's cool and, and 3D. So you zoom around in it, and actually, since I took that snap, um, the new version has writing that goes off backwards behind it, like the opening scene of Star Wars, you know. Um, so you can go behind and get more information off that. It's also point and click. So if I see an interesting blob, I can just go and click on it, and it'll steer the dish and tune to that frequency, and then I can see what's going on. Ultimately, I would like to have a little floating TV screen in here. So when you click on it, it actually beams it onto there, or a, a window with Wireshark running in it, and it, you see it in there. Because um, then Hollywood will hire me, and I'll you know, put my kids through college and all that stuff. So um, this is what it can do. As I said, steer to the satellite and so on. I was going to give you a live demonstration, but I'm told like I said at the beginning, they don't have interweb here, so I'm not going to be able to. 
Um, but I did take some screenshots like 10 minutes ago before I came in where I'm friends with the NOC, so they give me internet access. So this is an initial DVB snoop doing a PID scan and looking for datagrams. And what you get is a number. So that's the ID number of the PID. So 1505 and 1509 are both carrying data on this particular satellite. Yeah. So you can then tell DVB-Net to create an interface that's hooked to that PID. And if you then run ifconfig-a, you've actually got a device now with a hardware address, and it's sitting there waiting to be an Ethernet device. And if I bring it up, so I have config dvb not up, and then have a look at it again, you can see I'm starting to receive packets. So that's actually extracting the TCP data straight off the, the DVB card, sticking it on an ether for me. And that ether will behave just like any other ether. I can run Wireshark on it, I can create tunnels with it, I can do whatever I want. So here's TCP dump just running on the Ethernet, and this is raw data coming down off the satellite. And you would not believe what they send over the satellite unencrypted. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, when I was looking, I, I'm told that there's a law in the UK about intercepting packets that are not meant for you, so I haven't brought any of those packets with me. Okay. <laughs> It's just these numbers that describe these theoretical packets that you might see on this interface. And in amongst them, there may have been some web mail. Um, there was probably some financial data coming from, it was a live stock market ticker feed, uh, basically. Well, I saw lots of stock market symbols going by and a bunch of binary that was probably values of things. Um, okay. I'm running really early, so I'm going to, um, because I, th yeah, there should be like a 10, 15 minute demo now, which I really can't give you because I've got no internet, so I'm going to blame the con. That makes me look good and them look bad. Oh shit, I'm staff, hang on. That doesn't work. Okay, so um, yeah, sorry, I, can't, I just can't do it. So uh, who came to the opening talk? Joe Grant and his badgers. So he kind of threw down a challenge, uh, which he'd also done at Black Hat already. So I was forewarned, but not forearmed. Um, he mentioned that he had put some IR stuff into the badges and uh, kind of challenged me to do something with it, since I've spoken on IR before. So I thought I'd have a go. So the, the Joe Grand DEF CON badge has got a TV be gone in it, which I did mention during my talk. So yesterday I had a day of epic fail trying to get this done. Okay? So the first thing I did was try and solve a problem which I really didn't need to solve in order to tackle this. Because I thought to develop the, uh, anything for the badge, I would first have to figure out the puzzle that was on it. Has anyone successfully read um, the 2D barcode, or did you all just go to wired.com? So a few of you, okay. Uh, the way I did it was I took a picture, and then I loaded it into the GIMP, converted it to an RGB, maximized the contrast, and then um, my phone, actually, my Nokia N95 has a, a barcode reader on it. Just pointed it at that, and bam, it got it straight away. So um, very cool device, thank you. Um, very cool tool to have on your phone. So I read that, and that took me to a website which had that silly badge on it and the puzzle. And I was looking at that for a long time. Actually, a bunch of us were looking at it until we finally clocked that the B with the, the American flag on it was a US B. It's like, oh, my God. Because I really didn't need to know that because I already had a USB interface because we'd spotted it was a USB header, so I didn't need to solve that problem. So we abandoned the website and went to soldering. So uh, I, I don't see so good anymore because I'm getting old. I'm old school. So I got someone else to solder my USB header on for me, and they basically bricked the badge doing so. So um, 
Yeah, I've got a dead goon badge if anyone wants to trade me afterwards. And in the meantime, I've been, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are actually two red badges. Some of them say staff and some of them say goon. So I've been demoted to staff now instead of goon. So um, this is the one I, I ended up patching. I then couldn't find the development environment because it wasn't on the CD. Um, there was a bootloader, but no actual compiler. Um, the license server, when I did get the compiler, was down, so I couldn't download the license. Um, and then I finally got all that solved and had some working code, but couldn't get the bootloader to see the card. Okay. So um, some credits are due for the people that helped me solve all of these problems. So um, Zach, tactical chip monkey Franken, who's on next, um, he basically, you know, he just looks at solder and it melts and flows around contacts. And as you'll see in his talk, which I recommend you stay for because it's very, very cool, um, and I'm going to help him with it. Lost. Uh, oh, you're going to give me Etherweb. Okay, excellent. We might have a demo after all. Um, Hey. Um, yeah, Lost, who's running the mystery box thing, um, got me the Freescale development CD, which it turned out I could have just downloaded from the website later. So um, that saved me a lot of time. The Hardware Hacking Village, there was a guy in there who had copied the license file off Joe Grand at some point, and he gave me that. Um, and Sean Hillmeyer, who spent a couple of hours with me last night figuring out how to get the damn thing into um, bootloader mode. Anyone here actually trying to program it? How many of you have succeeded? One. Excellent. It was hard. Shouldn't be that hard, but then I suppose that's the challenge. Okay, so um, I thought I'll give you a tool. If you haven't got the steerable dish and you haven't got the, um, the the particular satellite receiver and so on, I'll give you a tool that helps you to do this the old-fashioned way. So I reprogrammed the badge. If you've looked at it, normally when you um, uh, when you run it, it's cycling through the power offs, and you see the little thing doing this, right? And then you get a solid bar at the end of the sequence. So that looks like that. And you'll see a solid bar will flash up. Yeah? Everyone saw that? So that's normal. Yeah, we're just starting Saturday. So. And that's Agent X talking in the background. So then I deleted all the power offs except the Phillips one just to check that I was actually changing the code properly. So you'll see now it's just doing one transmit and then a, a solid bar. So I knew. I was doing the right thing. Incidentally, if anyone hacks the TV be gone stuff, um, he's actually sending two of each code. So you could speed the whole thing up by halving the codes. The next problem was figuring out the protocol. So um, this is the way they're described in the TV be gone source code. So it's basically a bunch of timings uh, which is very different from the way I'm used to working with IR. The, all of that low-level crap was taken care of for me. All I had to worry about was ones and zeros. Um, so this is what my codes look like. So a code zero would be one, one, naught, 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 naught. And it was not at all obvious how the ones and noughts mapped onto these numbers. So it's not like a 184 is a one and a 92 is a zero. It's actually... Um, because it's frequency shifting, or your, your shifting state, um, it's really non-obvious. And it's particularly non-obvious if it's last night at 2 in the morning and you've been out partying and drinking and you know, you're know you not quite all there. But obviously IR has somehow got into my cerebral cortex because I never understood it. But at, at about 2.30, I was able to look at a 1010 pattern and just type in the things like zombie mode, and they worked. So. Um, I still don't understand the, the, the standard, but I got it. So I came up with TVBADD. So this will do all your channel hopping for you. You can just sit there with your beer like this. So there's my badge sitting in front of the TV.
Thank you. That was seven o'clock this morning. You get the idea, right? So, um, what I'm planning to do is put the patched code onto my stick, uh, and if we can, how many people of you here have actually managed to transfer a file? Oh, deathly silence, tumbleweed. Yeah. So there's a problem. Um, we're going to have a look at, now I've got this out of the way, um, we're going to have a look at that code and maybe see if we can figure out what's going wrong. But I keep, I bump into people who say they have done it, and I've seen it done. I, Joe demonstrated it to me um, over at Black Hat, so it definitely should work. But if I can, I'll put TVB Gone, the, the patched version, on my disk, and I'll start virusing the, the badges soon. Um, we're going to try and do the demo now. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, why don't you ask me questions while I do this? Uh, and we'll just do the questions and demo the other way around. Yes, sir. What satellite hardware did I use? Um, I used a thing called a Dreambox 7020. There is another model which has uh, interchangeable receiver modules, so you can have, it actually has two receivers in it um, called uh, the 7040, I think. Um, but at the time I started doing this, the, the hacked sort of Linux distributions uh, didn't work for the 7040, only worked for the 7020. Yeah. Um, for the steerable, I just went down to, uh, in the UK we have a store called Maplin's, which is just a cheap consumer sort of gadget store. Um, got it the cheapest steerable uh, motor I could find and uh, a one meter dish. I think I got 1.2 meter dish, so nothing really. Yes, sir. Uh, did I point at the geo orbits? You mean the, the stuff that's actually moving? Oh, I see. Did, okay, did I have an elevation function as well as um, uh, uh, east-west? No, I mean the, the dish steers a sort of a curve anyway, just to follow the curvature of the Earth and, and the, the path of the satellites, but um, I wasn't looking for anything that wasn't geostationary. So. But you could do the same thing with tracking moving satellites, and actually there are groups doing that. I think they're mostly interested in uh, well, not mostly, but they're also interested in photographing them, which is quite cool. That's, uh, you know, get a zoom picture of a satellite flying over your house. That's really cool. Yes, sir. What are the most interesting things that my alleged friends have found on these satellites? Um, that's some of the stuff that I can't talk, well, I can talk about, but afterwards we'll have to drag you out in one of those zip-up black bags and take you away. Um, I think that the, the story I described of Diana was probably the most interesting, or one of the most interesting, actually watching a live news event unfolding um, when the people participating were completely unaware that, that we were doing so was really, it was fascinating, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? How often do you find something interesting? Well, boobies every night. <laughs> what beside the boobies? Um, I hardly ever get past the boobies, to be honest. <laughs> That's why it took so long. <laughs> Is that food or friend? Uh, it depends what stage of the meeting we're at. So. Uh, 
uh, did I use a specific LMB? Yeah, I use a dual LMB um, just so I can it, it can switch quickly between. Um, there's like two satellites that that are in the UK, Hotbird and Astra. Um, I started with a dual LMB, so I could just get those, but then I moved to a steerable, and so you don't actually need it. A single, if you're on a steerable dish, uh, unless you want to go outside the frequency ranges. So um, if you wanted to go above 13 gig or below 10 gig, you would probably need a, a second LMB. But it, you, for steering, you don't need a second one. Uh, okay, have I ever tried to talk back to any of the data services? No, so far this has been purely a passive operation, just receiving stuff. Um, I would recommend you check out the satellite talk I mentioned at the beginning, the, the hacking a bird in the sky, because that one they actually do do a two-way um, transfer. Do I ever see a non-geosynchronous? Um, no, I mean, the, the, the trouble is this stuff, it's quite slow, the scanning and so on. So probably even if I did, it would just be a blip that, that would be there momentarily as it flew past. Um, there are ways to track those. I mean, they, it's all documented. Every, every path of every satellite is, is documented somewhere, so you can program a fast steering dish to follow them. Anyone else? Yes. Say again? How many IP streams have I seen? Um, well, if the demo is working, I can show you, hopefully. Okay. If I can get in, I'll bring it up quickly. Looks like I can. Excellent. That shouldn't be happening. Okay, hang on a second. Don't trust you guys. <laughs> okay, I'm a big girl, a big crypto girly. I left my privacy screen behind. That'll, that'll be enough. I'll just ah, tunnel. Damn it. Okay. Um, who in Ubuntu put this bloody pop-up here? Okay. So I'm logged into my box at home now. Um, so if I bring up, thank you, network team. The knock rule. Woohoo! Oh, by the way, if you're into InfoSec and you go to lots of conferences and you live out of a suitcase like me, this is an invaluable site, infosecdiary.com. It's got all the upcoming events. If it's not on there, use their submit thing and it gets put on there. Uh, I plan my whole life with this thing. It's really cool. Uh, So um, I've got a tunnel set up to the web interface back at home, which hopefully will give us something. Or not. Oh, okay. Sniff that, bitches. Say again? Please enlarge it. Uh, I don't have an easy tool to do that. Unless you know a shortcut. Yeah, does that work on web pages? No, I didn't think so. Um, oh, yes it does. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's what I get for being cocky. Um, and control shift minus will take it down, I guess. No, then you can see, you see, this is the problem. 
As soon as you switch it on, there it is, in your face, here, all night long. Damn it, what time zone is it in the UK? Oh yeah, they're on. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, shall we press the stream button? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think we're getting a fast enough feed. Uh, let's just cut to what I was going to show you. We'll come back to the boobies in a minute. <laughs> So if we click on data, okay, so uh, let's say Astra. So the trouble with this screen is I now can't see any of my controls. Control shift minus doesn't seem to go back the other way. Just control minus, okay. This is great. I learned so much coming to this conference. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, duh. Control shift minus is underline, dickhead. So. Okay, so uh, Hotbird has a whole lot of feeds. Each of these is a data feed. And so, for example, data two, on there, there'll be a number of PIDs. Depending on time of day, the, the transponders come on. Oh, incidentally, when I clicked on that, the satellite steered to that position. So even though it's still tempting me up here, reminding, this is like a permanent reminder. It's boobies going on on another channel. <laughs> I've clicked on that, my dish has just steered, and my kids are freaking out now. Oh, mommy, the dish is moving again. <laughs> Don't look. Soon there'll be like really naked people on the screen, isn't it? <laughs> so I've now steered to a data uh, channel. So if I go back to this window, I should be able to do uh, DVB snoop minus s pit scan. So this is the raw data coming off um, an alleged satellite somewhere in some country other than here. We do have an extradition treaty, don't we? Damn it. Okay, what we're looking for is a DVB datagram. Oh, we've done questions, so I can use my question time, can't I? We're still, we're still over? Do I need to cut here? Okay, so um, we'll do this. We can do this from the Q&A room afterwards if anyone's really that interested. I'm going to stay, I believe, and help Zach with his talk. Um, so we'll be both going together at the end. So um, thank you for your attention.